Okay, brief intro. One, if you are listening to this on YouTube, thank you for subscribing. I appreciate you. However, I would encourage you to listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. It just allows you to listen at a faster speed, and this way you're not locked into YouTube. You can listen while you do other things, okay? Um, And the second thing, if you find that my speaking is slow, please utilize uh, the speed increase function on whatever platform you are listening to. I myself, as my regular listeners know, will increase the speed um, in any broadcast uh, just so I can get the information in you know, half the time or a third of the time. Um, so I encourage you to do that as well. All right, now let's start the show. Now, this episode is going to be called Karma and Trauma, unless I come up with a different title by the end of the podcast. I have a feeling it's going to be another long one, but we shall see. The reason why is because my intent is that by the end of your listen, extreme paradigm shift. Ideally, I would like you to feel the way a person would feel after taking a historic dose of magic mushrooms without having to take a historic dose of magic mushroom. So when I say that this podcast will make you feel high in the tagline of this podcast, I mean it because I feel like there are more than one paths to a particular feeling, sensation, perspective, or mindset. This episode, you know, there's some episodes that I do that I know they're going to be sort of just like really intense. And I think this one will be one of them because the books that I read that have inspired and led me to this point in time of recording this episode were emotional books. I'm not an emotional person, if you guys have not noticed. <laughs> um, I pretty much operate. I have like one one kind of emotion, which is just kind of like, okay, pretty chill. Every once in a while, I might get angry, but that's becoming less and less so as I get older. Um and, you know, sometimes sad. Um, but once again, that's becoming less and less so as I get older and I've learned to manage the emotions of the ego of the body. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the ego or the body and I make that distinction, please check out my previous episodes. But I read two books over the last week. And normally I go through about three to five books a week, um, sometimes five to seven, just depending on the week. However, these two books, I have re-listened to them, each one of them, at least three times. Um, at least. Um, just over and over again, because every, I, really want that, I really wanted the information to become deeply ingrained in my psyche. The first book is called Same Souls, Different Bodies. Same Souls, Different Bodies. Can't remember the author right now, but I think it's Brian Weiss, actually. Yes, I think it's Brian Weiss. Um, And the second book is called It Didn't Start With You. It Didn't Start With You. Um, That one is by Mark Wolin. W-O-L-Y-N-N. You you read those two books back to back and you will feel just, it's just, I mean, after, while reading It Didn't Start With You, I was like halfway through it and I just felt this like, feeling of just intense compassion and just empathy. It felt like pain in my chest, but I obviously I like I didn't cry, not obviously, but I didn't cry. But I felt that just intense welling of emotion and compassion and empathy, not for myself, but for others. Um and this episode is essentially going to be a combination of both those books. Um and my hope is that when you're done listening to this, you go and you listen to them, you find them on you know audible or wherever you listen to your podcast if you don't have audible um i believe they sometimes run specials where you get the first two books for free i say give these two books a listen if you if you listen to nothing else this year this month however often you read um give those two books a listen and if they're not running the two book special they at least will give you the first book for free and i think that if I was going to tell you, okay, choose one of the two, I would say 
start with it didn't start with you because it is more grounded in um sort of matter in 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 trauma emotional trauma um psychological trauma and i think a lot more people will be able to relate to that as opposed to same souls different bodies which still deal with uh trauma but it's more trauma of of the consciousness um spiritual trauma and it deals with karma um as well whereas the second book it didn't start with you it, it's it, it there's also some elements of karma in there depending on how you look at it it's familial karma ancestral trauma um so they're saying the same things but they're saying it in different ways and the perspectives are just mind-blowing um i'm gonna start with a few personal stories i guess um before reading those two books um I would say that my relationship with my father uh, was strained. Not in the way that I think that he would have known about, I think. I think that I I do try to maintain a sense of respect in my interactions with my father. But if you know me on a personal level, you would know that I, up until recently just sort of perceive my father in a particular way. I, I would call him, I would say that he, you know, was a narcissist. Um, and extremely selfish, uh, incapable of loving anyone but himself. And that was stemmed, that stemmed from just his interactions with my mother. And of course, me as a daughter, the first daughter, I uh, identified with the struggles and pain of my mother right and as a result resented my father um and wanted him to be different okay i don't typically share a lot of personal stories but it is important to share that because i know that i'm not the only one who has these sort of feelings against members of their family um so this is important to share that to illustrate why these two books are important and the impact that they i believe will have on you the positive impact I believe that they will have on you. And not just in this lifetime, but might even change your future, right? Your future in more ways than one. I'll get into that. So I first read Same Souls, Different Bodies. And essentially that book, what the author basically said is a couple of things. One, you tend to, we tend to reincarnate. So first of all, we start with the premise, accept reincarnation as real. It is a thing. It happens. If you are Christian and you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to like accept that, please understand that in the Bible up until I believe like the 19th century or whatever, it was taught and Christ, Yeshua, um, he taught if this is your religion, I'm not a Christian, but I'm saying, hear me out, okay? He taught about reincarnation, and it was, uh, it was Constantine that removed references of reincarnation from the Bible for whatever reason. I, I don't know. It's up to you to kind of come to your own conclusion. So understand and accept that it is a thing. It does happen, period, okay? If you have an interest and you want to learn more about reincarnation, I have referenced this in previous episodes i will reference it now um, life before life i believe by jim moody and then if you don't want to read uh or not in a, you know because i know i'm also in the process of recommending two other books for you to read um there is an episode on netflix of a show called surviving death and I would suggest that you find the episode that deals with reincarnation and watch that. It's about they interviewed two little boys who remember their past lives. And then you form your own conclusions. Okay. Um, so back to same souls, different body. So the premise of the book is the author. Basically, he is a, a psychotherapist. So it's not a spiritual woo-woo, whatever. So if you are in a different category where you're predisposed to dismissing things because you feel that, you know, they may be phony or woo-woo, whatever you want to call it. This is an actual therapist who used and uses hypnosis to do past life regressions and future life regressions or whatever. But take the story as it is, yeah? 
Keep an open mind. Hear me out. You tend to reincarnate with the same types of people, the same people, the same souls over and over and over again. And what what happens is you're working things out, whatever relationships or trauma or experiences that you had in your past incarnation with them, depending on how you related to them, if there was or is unresolved trauma on whatever level that you did not work through, most importantly, if you have not or did not learn to be compassionate and empathetic towards these people in your life, you will reincarnate with them again <laughs> and again and again until you learn love. Okay? That's the first sort of key. Second, if you hate, this is the more important point, okay? If you hate anybody, if you hate a person, an individual, a group, nationality, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, hate. Hate is energy, right? It's an emotional energy, okay? If you hate or and or harm any members of a particular group, Right. This also applies to individuals that you have relationships with, but also groups, any particular group. You will reincarnate as members of said group over and over again until you learn the futility of hatred. I'll give you a story from an example from the book, Same Souls, Different Body. There was a lady who came to see the therapist and she was having marital issues with her husband. And she just said, I don't love him. And the therapist said, well, why? What's the problem? And she says, she does, he doesn't care. Her husband doesn't care about the Arabs. And so the therapist was like, wait, you're, are you Jewish? And she was like, yes. And she was like, and I hate the Arabs. Ooh, it's something to say, right? And, she, and, the, and the therapist was like, why? Well, what did they do? And she was like, well, they're, they're destroying you know, our country, they're harming my people. And my husband does not share the same passionate hatred, hatred towards them as I do. And I feel like he's essentially an embarrassment to, you know, Jew, you know the, to the Jews. Interesting. So then the, psych, psycho, the psychologist, excuse me, does a past life regression hypnosis therapy on her. As he regresses her, she starts to remember who she was in a past life. And here she starts to speak. And what does she say? She starts to speak in sort of like a German intonation. She says she hates the Jews. Yeah? And so all of that, pretty much exactly what she had just said, right, about Arabs, she said she expressed the same sentiment about the Jews, except she recalled being a German soldier during the Second World War, and she had harmed Jewish people. And now she has come back as a Jew. She's reincarnated as a Jewish woman. Right? So she came back. She was a German man, came back as a Jewish woman. She was a German man who hated Jews, came back as a Jewish woman. You'd think she would have learned. But now she hates Arabs. So then the therapist decides to do, okay, let's do a future progression. Let's see who you will possibly incarnate as, possibly being the operative word. I'm going to do a short form video on this on TikTok. We're going to combine everything together. Possibly, who will you reincarnate as? I'll give you one guess. What did she see? She was an Arab woman in the village who lived a short life, died, you know, violently. Um, But from what she could remember, for what she could see, she being the lady in the present, what she could see of her future self as an Arabic Arabic woman, Arabic young lady, um, she in the body of an Arab, now hated Christians. Thankfully, during her regression and progression therapy, she 
came to the realization, look, it's the cycle. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep coming back here. I'm going to keep reliving as different people, different groups of people that I hate until I learn the futility of hate. And from that moment, she let it go because she started to realize or she, it dawned on her that it's, you're, you're, there's a lesson here. You can learn it the easy way or the, or the hard way. You can learn, you can come back and live lifetimes over and over again, or you can figure it out and break, break the cycle. So the great thing about Same Souls, Different Bodies is that the author does a good job of blending in quantum physics. He does it in a subtle way, but it's quantum physics. He says all possible futures exist right now as probabilities. You guys have heard me say the same thing. He doesn't say it exactly in, the, in, in my words, but he says it pretty much the same conclusion. So you have the power of the present time to influence your future incarnations by the actions that you take right now. Okay, so we have sort of a predestined default futures, and that is dependent on your actions that you've taken both in the past and in the present, okay? And that essentially is what people would consider karma. It's fixed, right? You are, if you behave in a particular way, like the like the Jewish lady, if you walk around hating people, your karma is that you're going to come back as a person that you hate. It's not a punishment. I have said several times, right, regardless of whether or not People want to take the information. Earth is not a prison. It's a school. If you feel like it's a prison, that is on to you, right? For for some kids, for example, who don't like school, right? Elementary school or high school can feel like a prison. But at the end of the day, it is a school, okay? It is a school. And we're here to learn something, right? And every generation, every step, every incarnation. So, so each book that I'm mentioning right now are dealing with, one is dealing with the physical trauma. Hmm? And the second book is dealing with consciousness, non-material form, right? Karma. Okay. And because you are an entity that is a conglomeration comprised of both consciousness, right? the spiritual, whatever you want to call it, and form, matter, body, it is important for you to understand exactly what's going on on all levels. You, you need both books. They work together, right? One explains to you what can happen Con- you know, on a conscious level, on, on a spiritual level, to your astral body, right? To your soul. And then the other deals with the physical body, which is why it's important that you read these two books. So, The surefiest, just the most surefire way to reincarnate into a particular group of people. If you hate gays, cool, you're you're going to be gay. If you hate gays right now, until you deal with that shit, excuse me, excuse my language, until you deal with that and process and understand that if you take anybody's consciousness and you put them in any particular form that comes with predestined life experiences and environment, right? Their, 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 their nurture and their nature, right? Their DNA and then where they grew up, you combine that too. They will turn out a particular way. They will behave in a particular way. If you choose to hate them, the simulation, so we're throwing simulation hypothesis into this, okay? The simulation will, because it, it's set up and at this point it's getting speculative, but I guarantee you there's information to support exactly what I'm saying. So when I even say the term speculative, you can't see me. I'm throwing up air quotes. It's depending on who the person is listening to, but it it's, look, it's there. Okay. Everything is energy. This is, you know, Tesla said this, Einstein said this. Okay. And everything registers, everything, you know, nothing can be created or destroyed, just modified. So if you are like chill, just generating hate energy, That energy does not get destroyed when your body dies. It just gets modified. You just get shifted to another hateful body. And you call that karma. I'll say that again, right? See how I said it's not speculative? It's all energy. So if you're sitting there and you're generating this energy all the time, right, of hatred and anger, that energy does not dissipate, yeah? Yeah? You took energy and then you converted it into hatred, right? Emotional 
energy. You converted it to hatred. Now it's you. Now it's formed on you. And the simulation recognized that, okay, this is a hateful person. Okay. And you've heard people speak about there's different, there's different dimensions, right? They talk about you need to vibrate higher, right? And they say that this, this reality is, is, a, is a dense, it's a low vibrational level, okay? So when I say hate, right, this is not a, it's not, you, you know the energy. Energy of hate is, it feels hot. It feels dense. It feels heavy, right? This is a system. There's an intelligence in the simulation. All it does is it sorts souls, right? It sorts consciousness, okay? You, as a, a, a vibrational entity that's, you know, vibrating a particular, you know, level, right? You're going to be with similar individuals because that's just how it works, right? And they say, you know, heat rises sort of thing. So it, 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 that's just part of the nature of it, right? So all the heat molecules will move together, you know, one particular form. And the same thing with, you know, cold molecules will move together in a particular space. You see, you see the same thing with like salt water and uh, they call it brackish water. So when fresh water and salt water uh, touch, they can't mix because they're two separate entities. The density is different, right? So it's the same thing. If you are a lower vibrational entity, right? If you are constantly walking around from, from incarnation to incarnation, just straight up, just generating hate, 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 anger, 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 judgment, judgment, that is all negative, judgment, right? Apathy. You will keep, because that's just how the system, it's not personal. You're not a, it's not a punishment, right? If, if you have salt waters or, you know, salt water is, is sequestered to one part of the world, like in oceans or whatever, and you have fresh water, you know, another place, is it, is nature evil? No. Is nature saying, oh no, they like, we discriminate and you, you don't deserve to be where fresh water is? No, it's just every like attracts like right so you'll just be where certain forms are right so you will because you you can't die right once again energy cannot be created or destroyed consciousness what gives the body life cannot die right just modified you're not gonna die the body dies it's a vehicle beat this nail <laughs> over the head over and over again in every episode and i will say you know this this episode is not going to be the exception okay so you you know you don't die and it's one thing to you know to be like oh you're afraid of dying okay now that you have accepted okay you don't die you need to start thinking beyond this incarnation once again now that you've accepted you do not die you need to start thinking beyond this incarnation so that you can consciously shape your future incarnations and the forms that you will take, okay? Everything on my TikTok channel is meant, there's an underlining theme, no matter what I put out, there's an underlining theme to get people to start thinking consciously. Consciousness is the key to all of this. Awareness, making yourself aware of the voice in your head, making, that's why I push meditation, meditate. You can, you can separate consciousness from form, consciousness from the ego. Okay, this is all awareness. So you need to be aware. Listen, the, the, the good news is you're not going to die. Just the physical form dies. Okay, cool. Now that now we're on another level. Okay, For those of you who've been me, been with me from the jump, like we're, we're graduating together. Okay, so we, we got it. Okay, we're not going to die. Shit, okay, cool. Fine. Yay. Okay, wait a minute. Now what's next? Well, there's a little thing called reincarnation. Okay. Do you want to get stuck in a circle or do you want to spiral out of here? If you're tired, I don't know what to tell you. I apologize. Maybe that's why they, you know, wipe people's memories. It is what it is. But consciousness is immortal. That is the nature of our, who we truly are, that are inherently our species, right? We are living in a human body, but our true, who we are as a species is not the body. That's just the vehicle. We are uh, non-corporeal entities. We are non-physical life forms. We are non-physical life forms. So if you are hearing my voice, you're here for two reasons. One, either you are aware of the nature of this reality, and now you're here to help people graduate. You're a tutor. You are a teacher. You are here to remind people of the nature of, of this reality. And your job here is to help people graduate, to move on. Right? That's your job, right? 
teachers always go back to school. There's some teachers who graduate and go back to school. Like that's that's how teachers work, right? Because you have to teach in a school. So if this resonates with you, you're a teacher, right? That's why you're back here. Or you fucked up. <laughs> yeah. You fucked up and or and I, I I say that jokingly. It's not there are no accidents. It's just it is what it is. You're you're stuck in the cycle. You're stuck in the loop. If you are listening to this, this is your wake up call. It is now your time for you to graduate. And the way you graduate is you start breaking, you know, certain things, right? So you breaking certain chains so that you can move on now. It's time to graduate. It's time to graduate. Okay, so we're still on same souls, different bodies. And we're going to move on to the other ones. I'm going to combine these two. So it's going to be a dense episode, but stay with me. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm talking to you. You need to start thinking about what your future incarnations are going to be. Now, after you listen to this, go back on my hop back up on my TikToks and watch a lot of my videos because I talk about all of these things, you know, tongue in cheek, maybe joke, whatever you want to say. But the underlining theme is education. The underlining theme is I'm, I'm trying to, I'm making you aware. It's not even necessarily teaching you, just reminding you of who you are and what, what you know, has been temporarily sort of closed off to you. If it's resonating with you, it's because you're remembering it, okay? So you go back and you put it back together. All of time is happening at once and all possible, all probable futures exist right now as probabilities. If you are living a life where you are hateful, you know, or anger, or, you know, you're holding on to emotion, negative emotions, anger doesn't mean you're a bad person you just be mindful that you of the energy that you're generating the system the simulation is it's it's not emotional emotions are for human beings right they're not it's not for the system the system is it, it's i would even argue it's amoral right morality once again is for human beings okay it does not care if okay the reason why you're angry at this person or you hate this person is justified it doesn't it just goes okay that's fine you can feel that way but when when it's time for the sorting hat right (laughs) harry potter reference it's just going to sort you according to whatever categories your present you know your consciousness is exhibiting let go let go or repeat the cycle that's it now two things happening here i remember you know, like I, like I mentioned, my father and my mother, they're, you know, they're still together. And every time my mom would call, it's to complain about something my dad was doing. And, 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 and that for years was what, like I said, sort of drove my sort of resentment, apathy, whatever you want to call it, anger towards him. The behavior I felt that he should have been exhibiting to his wife as a father. See, judgment, right? Then I read this book and I realized, holy shit. And I said to my mom, first of all, unless you want to keep reincarnating with his soul, with his consciousness, which I'm assuming because you guys are have such strong emotional connections to each other, emotional connection. That doesn't mean it has to be a positive emotion, right? Anger is still an emotion you can be you can be emotionally connected to somebody that you love you could also you will also be emotionally connected to somebody that you hate and what i said to her was look if you want to keep reincarnating with this person keep hating them you will be locked in the same cycle of behavior maybe next time you'll be the husband and he'll be the wife okay because the system does not care what he has done Okay, and my parents are Christian. My father's a pastor. My mom's a you know, very staunch Catholic. She she prays all the time. I said, listen, you can't say you believe this stuff and then you're not, you know, acting on the things that you claim to believe. Okay, if you don't want to, if you want to, like, okay, if you want a next your next incarnation to be on a different level, you know, disconnected from anybody that you have emotion negative emotional connections with them then the the easiest way to do that right now is you let go right now this is how you change your future otherwise you will keep looping right you hate him you will become him in the next in, in your next incarnation 
And because you two are now psychically linked, I would say entangled, right? Another quantum physics, you know, uh, word, quantum entanglement, right? And and the soul consciousness is, is quantum entangled with matter, with everything. Consciousness generates matter, okay? This is, you got to understand what's really going on beyond surface level because you are emotionally entangled now with this the more you 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 feed that it's that is the future you are increasing the probability of experiencing a particular future incarnation where it's you two doing this shit again over and over again that is hell to me that is the you know when Jean-Paul Sartre says hell is other people yeah. <laughs> Hell is being emotionally connected, psychically entangled with other people. Neg- negatively. It's a negative emotional expression. Over and over again for all eternity or until you realize like enough. You need to let go. You need to understand that he is, he is who he is. There's nothing your anger can do. So you might as well be compassionate and patient. Protect yourself. Protect your energy. But understand. The cycle will repeat between you two. Until you let go. And this is the time. Now is the time to change your future now your like i said it all exists as probabilities there is a future where now she's you know either the, you know they're together but it's not this sort of weird co- you know chaotic sort of negative emotional connection or she's just she moves on to the next world that was would would have been what would have trapped her in this vibrational level you let go or be dragged right and then I had to pause and self-reflect. And I said, you know, what am I carrying here? The anger, the animosity, is this mine? Or is this my mother's? And why is he the way he is? It was a question I asked and the universe answered by leading me Towards this other book, It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin. Like back to back. The fact that this they just the these two books came to me at the same exact time. There's an intelligence here. So, first thing I had to realize is this. The key to, to breaking out of here, right? Is the key to ending all entanglements is love. It, it sounds hokey, right? But gosh, I don't know how many times, you know, they say love is the answer. Love is the key. Love is the way out. Love is the way back home. Like, I don't know how many times we have to get programmed with this to understand that that, that is, and it, it that's the answer. And it's not blind love. It's just the understanding that look in that other person that you have, are channeling all, all this negative emotion and, and energy to, they can't even help being what they are. You can raise your eyebrows all you want to, but I say it again: they can't help being what they are. And I will prove what I just said in this very episode. So, what is the point of judging them? Who are you to judge them? And it, and bear in mind too. Understand this. So this is a different sort of perspective that hit me. You know, sometimes I have dreams where I'll have like full-blown relationships with people. Like I've had dreams where emotionally I, I, I have children. Like I, I think I've shared some of those dreams. Like I'll have children. And in the dream while I'm dreaming, God, like it feels real. And sometimes I wake up and I go, man, like I'm never going to see my see them again. Because it was just a dream. But while I was in the dream, it felt real. All right, and I'm sure you've had the same experience too. Now bear this in mind. Every person that is in your life right now, everyone, 
is somebody that you once had an emotional connection with in a past incarnation. I'll say this again. Everyone that is in your life right now, that is connected to you in one way, shape, or form, no matter what bodies they're wearing, you had at one time in a previous incarnation had a relationship with them. Bruh. If everyone is your loved one, if everyone that you're in, 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 in interacting with right now, like your, your neighbor, what if that was your son in a past life that died in a war? Go take yourself back to a previous incarnation. They died in a war. And you feel that pain, that emotional pain of like, oh my God, I'm never, I'm never going to see them again. And then they reincarnated as your neighbor. Like how fucked up would that be if you're like hating on your neighbor? But if you could see the forest from outside of the tree and you looked at it from uh, uh, the, eye, you know, the, the God's eye view, okay? And that person that you're beefing with was actually a child in a previous life. Bruh. That changes everything, doesn't it? It changes everything because now all of a sudden everybody could be a loved one. All of a sudden everybody is a loved one. Think about all those dreams that you've had where it's like, you know, you you fall in love with somebody and then you wake up and you're like, man, what the fuck? (laughs) Like that felt real. And then it's like, you you meet somebody and then and, and they're like your best friend. And it's platonic, but you just have this weird like emotional connection to them. Could be love-hate kind of thing, who knows? But we assume that because we are meeting somebody, it's all random, but nothing's random. There are no coincidences, yeah? It's funny, people keep saying I'm related to that no coincidences guy. I'm not. <laughs> Unless I am. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? So if you walk around treating everybody like shit, when the people that you interact with could have been like your best friend, your mother in a past life, an uncle, a grandma, just, it changes the way you look at people. All of a sudden you're like, oh my God, like everyone could be a loved one. And then compassion starts to creep in. Man. Now I'm going to switch. We're going to switch to the other book now. I'm going to come back if I need to, but we're going to switch to the other book. So the other book now, what does it deal with? Okay. It didn't start with you. I'm going to try to do this book justice, but you should read it. Both books, honestly. Because I can't say enough in a podcast, in a one hour, one and a half hour long podcast, you need to read it for yourself. Because again, too, there's some stuff that I may have glossed over because, you know, it's familiar to me, but might be deeply profound and life-changing for you. Read those books. It didn't start with you. It start with a story. It was a young man who his whole life was normal, well-adjusted until he hit the eight age of 19 and then one day he felt suddenly cold and then he developed insomnia couldn't sleep and when by the time he went to go see the therapist mark wolin uh he had he looked 10 years older than he actually was and he just kept saying i feel like if i sleep i will die that's all he kept saying like i don't know where this is coming from i don't know why i feel this fear but I feel like if I fall asleep, I will die. I'm afraid to fall asleep. And that was his insomnia. Well, the doctor asked him, is there anybody in your family that had experienced any sort of traumatic event involving falling asleep in the cold and the cold, cold and falling asleep? Come to find out. A genetic uncle, his mother's brother, had died in the cold from hypothermia. He was out working and 
something happened and I'm sure as he lay dying, the only thing he could think about was, I can't fall asleep. If I fall asleep, I will die. That trauma burnt into his DNA, passed on into the life of a nephew to be activated at guess what age the uncle had died? 19, at the exact same age. The, the nephew felt the exact same thing that the uncle felt. Now, the book did not talk about the possibility that the young man could actually be the consciousness of his uncle. This is why I am, I'm the one, I'm linking the two together. Because this isn't always the case for some, from all of the stories in the second book, Same Souls, uh, I'm sorry, um, it didn't start with you. But we have brains, we can form the connections. After reading, and I think that's why the universe or the intelligence, whatever you want to call it, my higher self, my future self, wanted me to read these two books back to back because it wanted me to connect the two. The nephew could very well have been the consciousness, the soul of his own uncle. And that's why it got triggered. But that isn't necessarily what this book is saying. I'm the one telling it to you. I want I want you, and I'm saying this, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying this because I want you, when you read these two books, to put those two together. Okay. Now, here's another story. You have a lady who, I don't remember exactly what age it happened for her, but she was living a sort of regular life. And then all of a sudden... She woke up one day with just feelings of like a deep sense of wanting to die. And not just of wanting to die, but wanting to die in a very specific way. She kept talking about wanting to evaporate, to incinerate herself. Now in the book, it's a bit heavy, but in the book, she meets with the therapist. And she matter-of-factly says yes, so she is planning on taking her own life and the way she intends on doing so was to walk into I think like molten steel or something in her job and essentially would just eviscerate burn herself right now the now the therapist the author he had worked with survivors of the holocaust and in his experience, he noticed that those sort of feelings of wanting to die in that way were something that kept sort of recurring during therapy sessions. And so he asked her, he said, has anybody in your family, has anybody in your family, did they, anybody in your family live through the Holocaust? Now, if I'm remembering this correctly, you have to read the book to, to you know, to verify on your own, but... I believe it was her grandmother. Her grandmother was a survivor of the Holocaust. And she had watched her loved ones, her family members, die in that way. And so that survivor's guilt, that pain that she felt of not wanting to survive and to and wanting to die alongside people she loved, once again, it, it left remnants in her DNA in her genetics and that same feeling was passed on now to the granddaughter who wanted to die in the exact same way this is mind-blowing this is mind-blowing this is a relatively recent book the information on there the research on there is on this phenomenon is fairly recent but there's loads of information online right now that you can search look up the works and the research of a dr rachel uh, gosh, I can't remember her name. Dr. Rachel. Oh, man. It'll come to me. Um, but she is referenced a lot in the book, which is why I recommend you read the book. Um, or just Google Mark Wolin, which his name I do remember. Um, and he references her research. But there's loads of information on there um, on the Internet about generational PTSD and inherited trauma. Okay. Now, essentially the conclusion here is this. If a member of your family has experienced any sort of life-threatening 
event. Abuse. War. Famine. Slavery. Any sort of thing that would trigger symptoms of PTSD. Not only would that family member experience those symptoms, it is absolutely, it is now verifiable through epigenetics, through neurobiology. They have shown through psychotherapy as well, they have shown that it is absolutely possible. It is absolutely possible to pass on and for one to inherit PTSD symptoms. So people who experience anxiety, depression, nightmares, inability to sleep, right? Living, feeling like they're on the edge all the time. Typically feelings that are associated with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Those feelings may not have originated from their own personal traumatic experiences, their own personal life, but they could actually have inherited these symptoms. It is wild. This is wild. Okay. Not only that, they, they, they've taken this information and they've done studies. They have introduced, like on, on lab rats, they've introduced one generation of lab rats to particular fears. Okay. And then they have found that two, three, four generations later, children, right, offspring of, of the mouse that were programmed trained to fear this thing inherited the fear inherited the fear of something that they had never experienced so this is true now this book i'm i'm just gently sort of glossing you know talking about it this book goes into like more depth obviously because it's a book okay when reading this book i started to personal think personally think of my fears, because a book will prompt you to sit down and write the things that you are afraid of. And suddenly I became aware that a lot of the things that I did in the past, a lot of my fears, a lot of my anxiety, a lot of things that triggered reactivity, depression, me being on an edge, defensiveness, I thought they were mine because they were coming from me. But I realized that Listen, I am I am the daughter of a woman who lived through the Biafran genocide. Google Biafra genocide. B I A F R A. My mom would tell me stories of what she went through during the war and how her people were wiped out and she saw this as a child. As a child. You think that living through war and genocide would not have had an impact on her psyche? And personally, which is why, obviously, I went down the path of everything that I've been on, you know, eventually microdosing and mushrooms, which, by the way, ever since Wim Hof and reading these two books, the Wim Hof Method and reading It Didn't Start With You and Same Souls, Different Bodies, I haven't even felt the need to, to use mushrooms. It's like I've learned to just cope with my my ego and the trauma of the body that the body holds by making my by becoming more aware more conscious but also self soothing and i was doing this even before reading these two books right but the wim hof method of the breathing and i talked about it on some lives um as well but the deep breathing exercises i do you know three four rounds in the morning three four rounds at night it's kind of it basically is a meditation but it's a different type of meditation that it also heals and calms yeah but as i'm listening to this book i'm listening to it didn't start with you and i'm realizing like god my mother it like forced me to empathize with my mother to all of a sudden realize, because it was affecting me, right? To realize, okay, a lot of the things that I have exhibited and all of the symptoms I exhibit, like I would go to places and I'm hyper aware of my surroundings. Like I'm just always, my husband would always say, like, you always think about what the worst possible thing could happen. And I always feel this sense of like, I need to be in somewhere that's guard gated with lots of walls and a security guard because I always felt like I needed to be safe. Not to say that I didn't have personal trauma, 
that caused me to feel that way. I did at the age of 10. My father was abducted at gunpoint and they put a gun in my face. This was in Nigeria and he was taken away. So our compound was, was breached. We had a guard gated home. We had a security guard, but the security guard was working in tangent with these criminals, these kidnappers, and they came and they took him away. He, he ended up being okay. But clearly that happened to me at 10. Like, I feel like that does something to your psyche. It was not, I was nine or 10 and, and obviously that's traumatic. But the other, you know, feeling of just like constant fear and constant worry, not only just that, of just being hyper aware of anything that could happen at any given point in time. Like even when I travel, just feeling like anything could happen at any point in time, you know, is that all mine? And then I have a fear of, you know, uh, uh, losing my child. Where is that coming from? Well, I lost my sister. That is traumatic. My mother lost a child. And now that's mine. Right? And I have the fear of losing everything. So everything is tied to loss, loss of security, loss of loved ones. I don't care if I personally die so long as my death is not make other people suffer. So if I guess if I, it's, it's a weird sort of catch 22, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's contradictory. Um, unless of course I die at an old age and that's perfectly okay. Um, but (sighs) this fear of loss of, 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 of loved ones, where is that coming from? Where is that coming from? Well, clearly there are people in my family who had lost my, my, my grandfather, his first love died. Now that's mine, right? His first wife died. We walk around with this emotional baggage that we think belongs to us because we feel it. But if these research, and I'm saying they're finding biological markers, they're not just through therapy, okay? It's not regression therapy, or even if you look at that and you're like, I don't want to accept that. Mm. It is what it is. But this is, they're finding biological markers in the genes. It says, look, this happens, absolutely happens. Things like low cortisol levels get passed on to the next generation. So if a woman experiences, and this is controversial, but if she experiences too much stress after a while cortisol which is supposed to help you deal with stress gets depleted and then you just have low levels of cortisol and then that gets passed on to the next generation and then your children can't deal with stress or they're anxious or they're afraid or they're depressed and you think it's you you think it's your shit but it's not i mean just combining the two combine combining the two books the trauma from your past lives and deaths, plus the trauma of your ancestors' past lives and deaths. And we're carrying this shit, thinking this is all ours. Another personal story. And, I, and I, it's, it's hard for me to share this with, with total strangers. I, I, I don't typically make a habit of, of sharing personal stories. I'm not that open you know, I'm very protective of myself, but I know that those who are listening, if you're listening this far, then you've earned this story, I guess. It's a weird way to say it, but. Every time I would get close to a man, there was a part of me that would automatically repulse. Mike would automatically pull, and I'm married. I've been married twice. This <laughs> my second marriage. And I sat and I had a talk with my mother and I said, tell me the story of the women in our family. Well, as far back as she knew, my great-grandmothers on both sides. One was beaten, right, by her by her husband. Her husband had two wives. You know, she was the first wife, and then he went and got a younger wife, and then he would beat her and my grandmother. So, that's men physically abusing. That's you think that just goes away? No. On my grandfather's side, his mother, I asked my mom what happened to her husband. Well, he died. What do you think? Where do you think a fear of losing a spouse comes from? That's there. 
And she had to raise three kids on her own. Okay. And from that point on, she would fight with men. In fact, people in, in their village would say, like, that was what she was known for. She would fight with men. Like, she was a very strong woman, physically, you know, domineering, strong. And she would fight with men. Where, where, what happened? What relationship did she have with her father? You know, it's, it's blank. We don't know. Okay? And now you have my grandmother. So those are my great-grandparents. You know? Now you have my grandmother beautiful woman loved her i never met my grandfather he died um but she lived separately from him like they stayed married but they lived in two different cities is that a loving relationship i don't think so and then we have on my father's side he lost his father when he was young 11 12 years old very young and his mother said, I'm too young to settle down and raise kids. She had like three kids. So she abandoned him. And so he was raised by his uncle. Remember I started this podcast saying, you know, my, my father, I would I would judge him. He's evil. He's a narcissist. He's I never paused to ask myself, well why would he be like this? It's not like he was raised by you know, like it's not like this is a person who had a happy, healthy childhood and he turned out to be. Something clearly had to happen. And I what I've read a narcissist is that a lot of the times deep down inside they just they're they're they, they have this like crippling sense of being alone and not being loved or not being worthy of love and so that's why they behave that way. If you had the person that was supposed to show you love essentially abandon you and my guess is that she probably wasn't the best mother leading up to that point you know you kind of look at the world completely different than somebody who has had a nurturing caring loving relationship with both their parents you have another one who died so he was essentially an orphan at a very young age is there stuff there that he's dealing with and and not this is not even to judge his mother because how was she raised? I don't know. How was she raised where she felt that way about her own children? You see here? So it's just trauma passed from one generation to another generation to another. We are all walking as exposed wounds, trying to make the best out of our lives while lashing out at each other, while we're touching each other's exposed wounds. And you think that the shit that you carry is yours and it's not. It's not all yours. You're carrying all of this. We're carrying all of this. And then we have my mom and my dad, as I've explained, their marriage, they're still together, but gosh, I, I can't tell you how many times as a kid I would watch them and go like, what's point you guys don't even love each other why are you together but then i realized why she stayed together because nobody else in her family did even her grandmother separated from her husband who beat her when you start taking yourselves out of your own shoes and looking at people and respecting their life experiences and understanding that there's things that they went through to make them feel, say, act, behave a particular way. How can you judge? How dare you judge? You know, in our society, we tend to elevate judges, right? Like, oh, this is a judge of the panel. Da, 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 da. Is that something worth elevating? A judge sits at a at a at a court and, and just goes, you, you know, we sentence you to blah, 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 whatever. And we say these, you know, this is a venerated and honorable judge. And on some level, we're constantly casting judgment on everything. Thumbs up, thumbs down. How dare we? And yes, I understand the irony of my statement. It's a little bit judgmental, but I am now going to interject compassion because that is our society. That is what we are taught. We are judgmental because we are taught to judge. We are judgmental because we too are judged. And we are judged unfairly. So I'm sitting and I'm listening to this book and my heart 
feels with just it's like ugh, I can't describe the feeling. It was like it's like when you're about to cry, but I couldn't shed tears, and I realized, I realized it. So, the thing about my mother, I think, because she'd seen so much death and pain during the genocide of her people, she just something happened to her tear ducts, and she just couldn't cry. She can't cry even when I lost my my sister when she lost her child. I watched her. She would wail. This heavy wail. But tears would not come in her eyes. Like she could not form tears. And I always just thought like. Even as a kid I thought like. Man imagine how much you had to cry. Where you don't cry. You can't cry anymore. You've just cried so much that you can't cry. And when I listened to that book, I hit a point when they talked about genocide and they talked about losing a child. And I just, I never, even my father, he lost a child. I I just, I never flipped the perspective because I was so self-absorbed with my own shit, judging other people on how they should be parents. And I never flipped it. God, like I started to cry, but without the tears in the exact same way my mother cried, which just made it even more like intense. And I was like, fuck. And that just broke something in me. And that willingness to just always constantly wanting to judge, that just destroyed. It just got, and I picked up the phone and I called my dad. Now, I talk about, I talk about this world having an intelligence. And I talk about Sometimes things seem a particular way because we are in the forest and we say, why is this world the way it is? And we think, we judge, we think, look, we could do a better job for whatever reason. We wouldn't do this, that, and the other. But then I realized, you know, my dad has been on dialysis since I was 17 years old and and I have judged him for it because I've judged him harshly for it. Because essentially when he was around, like in his 40s, he got diagnosed with high blood pressure. And all he had to do was take a pill. That's what I say. All he had to do was take a pill. And he said he wasn't going to take a pill. His body, his God was going to heal him. And that didn't happen. And then a decade later, you know, he died and he got to get resuscitated. And he has been on dialysis ever since. And he's in his mid-60s. So it's a very long time to suffer in that way. And I have judged him harshly. And while listening to this book, I said to myself, Joe, you've been diagnosed with something. It's an autoimmune disorder. They don't know what it is. But essentially, it's my body destroying or attacking itself. My body attempting to destroy. And I'm using destroy intentionally because I posted a video today on self-destruction and uh, annihilation. How we're destroying ourselves. We're destroying this planet. And we're kind of walking around with this sense of self-destruction. That's what cancer is. That is what an autoimmune disorder is. It's the body attacking itself. And they diagnosed me with this thing. And then they said I needed to take a medication that would shut down my body's ability to fight off disease. Right? It would destroy, it would shut down my immune system. And I refused the medication. And I've decided I'm going to treat it myself. Now, when my dad decided to not take his medication. It's no different than I deciding I'm not going to take my medication. The only difference is that he, in the 90s when he did this, did not grow up in a, in a society where if you want information, if you want to learn how to heal yourself, you can pick up a fucking phone and search for it and find the information, the same information that I have access to that has now allowed me to Google as many vitamins as I take and a way to eat and, and listen to audiobooks and things of that nature. He did not have. All he had was his faith. So he counted on his faith to heal him. And while his faith has sustained him, he has suffered. But his life has been extended, but he has suffered. So the only difference between him and me is that I had access to knowledge and he didn't. So he went in a different path and I was angry at him because to me, it seemed so simple as to take a pill, but God, what if something happens to me? I genuinely believe that by living this way and not shutting down my immune system and taking control of my health, I will be okay. But God, how much would that break my heart if my daughter If something happened to me and the path that I chose did not work in my favor, 
And my daughter resented me for it. Fuck. So I picked up the phone. And I called my dad. Is he still sometimes, I don't even want to say the word annoying. He is who he is. Yeah. But he's my dad. Whether or not he's a narcissist, I don't fucking care. If he is, it was because of circumstances that he could not control. that led him to the path that he is on now. And for whatever happened in his past incarnation that's making it so he has to suffer this way, I don't fucking know. I don't create the simulation. All I know is that it is his consciousness going through this. The body is just a vehicle. What is 70 years for an infinite being? But the greatest feeling that I had was when I paused and stepped back and realized like holy shit I don't know how I came across these two books but had I not come across these two books at the time that I came across them and my father had passed away and then I had read these books and I would not have been able to while he was still alive forgive forget heal make amends and just love him for who and what he was I would have felt horrible. And the fact that this book made its way into my life and the intelligence that led me to the book, and to these two books, together, to talk to me, to communicate with me. My God. My goodness. That's love. That's love. You know, if you're still listening, if you made it this far, thank you. This has probably been the most emotional episode I've ever done. And I'm not, I wasn't an emotional person. At least if you would have said that, If you would have said that, hey, you are an emotional person, I would have rejected that because I prided myself in being more logical. But the logic, the intelligence, right? It's masculine. It was a guard like Mars, right? It was a guard to protect my heart. If you look around, you see, you look at the human race. If you take into heart everything I've just said, And you apply it to everybody that you deeply, even people that you just hate. (laughs) Can you hate them? Can you hate them with the understanding that people are walking around blinded by their, by trauma and karma, carrying their pain? Everyone is in pain. person that cuts you off (laughs) it's always a good example right they're going through some shit like you've heard it said before it's not even like they're just going through some shit like it's like okay fine we're all going through some shit but they're going through some shit that they don't even know that they're going through and i will add on top of that they're going through other people's shit that's fucked up man they're going through other people's shit. In addition to your shit, you're going through your ancestors' shit? Like, how is that fair? I know they say life is unfair, but fuck. Is that fair? And with that in your mind, do you have the energy now to just be tense all the time against people wanting to attack and to... Ugh, man... What's the use? What's the point? I can understand now. You know, like you, you, you can understand now. So my brother calls, 
And all these words I used to use to define him, I've thrown out. He's just consciousness in a body. And I'm sitting having a conversation with you know, the, with our housekeeper, and she's crying because her mother is dying of cancer. And I look at her. She's so intelligent. She's, we're, I'm wearing glasses. She's wearing glasses. She could easily have been a doctor. She understands this stuff. But her fucked up circumstances that from you know born out of her past karma and ancestral trauma. Now she this is what she does for a living, and she's going through a very hard time. But all I see is consciousness in a body. I am consciousness in a body. You are consciousness in a body. It's different shapes, different colors, all consciousness in your body. And I could easily be you. I could easily be you. Then it just starts to change. You know, the, the author talks about in the first book, Same Souls, Different Bodies, it is possible for consciousness to split form and to embody two bodies at one time. There's no limitation there. So now you're looking... And thinking, man, could this be me? Could she be me? And then you go, I'm going to help. Because by helping you, I could be helping myself. Now let's bring in the, the first book, Same Souls, Different Bodies. By helping you, could I be helping a daughter from a past life? A father that I didn't help in the past incarnation and now is my opportunity to help now. The illusion here, the greatest illusion in this world is the illusion that we're separate. And even if you subscribe to the many wars hypothesis, it's still... Even if you subscribe to the many worlds hypothesis, and even if you believe in aliens and reptilians, it's still consciousness in various form. Everyone you interact with, yeah, look, let's let's say, you know, let's say they said humanity, the human race has been on this planet for a hundred thousand years, as far as we know. You, your soul has lived how many thousands of lives? And loved how many, how many people? Loved and lost how many people? And you interact with these same people every day. You have no idea who these people you're interacting with. People that you may have lost and loved. Now you're, now, now is the time to heal. Now you are aware. What do you do with this information? You treat everyone like your child, like a loved one. Because look, at the end of the day, I don't know who, who, put the situ- who put the simulation together. I've grappled with that after reading this. I, I take a step back and I go, what the fuck, man? Like, why... Why do this? Why why put us here? Why wipe our memories? Why why have us carry the trauma from one generation to another? As is described in It Didn't Start With You. Why have us continuously reincarnate and you know in the same sort of lives lives as, as described in same souls, different bodies? Why have us go through karma if we could remember this? You know, take both books. If I could remember my past incarnation or if I could tap into the memories of my family and their trauma then I I would at least with the knowledge I would have the power to do something about this and to love people but maybe that's not the what the nature of the school is and I that is what I had to come to because there was a temptation there to then get angry at the creator of this world and I had to remind myself who made it, what made it so that these books came to me? There's a benevolent energy there. And once again, what is a lifetime to an immortal? It's a school, I don't understand it. As a human being looking at everything, do I feel like it maybe could have been done differently? Absolutely. 
but that is me looking, you know, while I'm consciousness, I'm looking through the eyes of a human being. And every single story a person, when they talk about when they have an ash, you know, out of body experience, there is an understanding once they separate from form that, you know, it's all good. You know, that sense of every, it, everything is as it should be. It, it is there. It's just once you enter the psyche and the body and all of this stuff that comes with the vehicle. You forget that. And I guess, you know, to kind of pull even from my, my own podcast, you know, on the, the Dark Oracle's Guide to the Multiverse, I say, you know, I ask the question, what sort of what sort of species would create such a civilization? And I said it would be an immortal species. It would be an immortal species would create a world where everything, you know, dies. Because it's, you know, that would make sense, Right? And maybe the world, the, the world had to be, be this way. Somebody said I don't mention or talk about Alan Watts a lot. I will now. There was a story he gave. He, he told about the game, and he said, you know, remember, remember. I think that's how he starts it. It could be wrong, but he says, you know, you had a chance to dream. All right, it's like a lucid dream. All right, so you wake up in a dream and you look around and you go, oh, okay, well anything is possible. Then you would do everything. Right, you would live this way, then you live that way, and then do all that, and then eventually you would go, okay, I want to be able to live all of this stuff, but not know that I'm dreaming, and then you would live this world now. And that's the thing that you almost have to take away from all of this is that perhaps the other way exists or has been tried. I mean, there are infinite realities so maybe this is just the reality where you don't remember or this is just the reality where the bodies that you inhabit and i hint at i talk about this on the other podcast the anthology maybe this is a reality where the body that you inhabit carries genetic trauma and you're just playing on you know it's a hard mode it would make sense i mean look i when i play video games I, you know, I'm aware that there are different settings, you know, in the game. And if you, if you want to say, okay, we're living in a simulation, you have to understand that whatever it is that created this world, right? There's Dr. Jackson who, who said, physicist Dr. Jackson, he said, there's code writ in the fabric of our reality. I accept what he said. Whatever it is that created this simulation, this simulated reality, they simulated it for a reason. You have to keep bearing in mind that all of this is temporary. Matter is temporary. Matter is temporary. Consciousness is forever. It would make sense that this world, the way it is, is as it is. And as hard as it is to say that with all of the things that I know are occurring in this world right now, what I've learned and I'm constantly learning is the futility, not just of hatred, but of judge judging. What's the point? What's the point? What's the point of judging others? Like, who, who the fuck am I? Just consciousness in a body. I don't know their story. They don't know their story. They don't know what they're carrying. They don't know why they're that way. They are as much, quote, victims of their circumstances. You know, I, I've talked about over and over again about free will being an illusion. God, you have no fucking idea. It is deeper than just a philosophical explanation of, okay, you know, determinism, all of that, bro. Like if you are carrying the trauma and acting out the trauma of people who live before you, how can you say that you, your default setting is free will? Like, bro, you don't even know what you're carrying. You're, you're experiencing the symptoms of people's past trauma? The fuck? You're not even aware of it. Like I'm saying, like this is recent, recent studies that are now starting to go, oh shit, there's some stuff happening. You know, I posted a video today 
on my TikTok channel. It's about, I called it casual nihilism. The idea is to get people to understand that that deep feeling that something fucked up is about to happen is inherent in all humans. Because something fucked up is about to happen. (laughs) Like we're all gonna die. Um, But if you're carrying the trauma of your past ancestors and family members they have also felt that deep existential dread of like they're about to die and more imminently than you because you've never most people you know that are listening to this are probably mid-20s mid-30s or whatever most people you know maybe you've got you know had a car crash that you and you thought you were almost gonna die or you were diagnosed with some fucked up illness and you thought you were gonna die all right but that's in one lifetime now imagine, like, so my grandmother, she was burned. And I have all these burns on my body. Just, I had this weird thing with fire when I was a kid. <laughs> so I have all these, like, burn marks on my body. What the fuck is that from? I'm just doing things. I didn't even realize what I was doing. I, had to, I just was a weird kid. I like to play with fire. And if you'd asked, you know, my parents, well, why is she, like, what's this thing about fire she keeps doing? Well, they'd probably just be like, she's a weird kid who likes to play with fire. But it turns out somebody in my family died from fire. She was messing with fire, got burned, got infected. One of my thumbs, guys, and this is only for people who listen to my TikToks. If you look when I do my TikToks, one of my thumbs is like half the length of the other. It looks like a toe. And I was playing with fire. It got burned, got infected. So I ended up with Whitlow. So I've got a fucked up thumb now. (laughs) That was my great-grandmother. Okay, so we're all carrying this shit. We're all carrying this shit. All of us. How do you not feel compassion for people? Despite even what the, their lives might appear to be, you know, you have you have these celebrities and they say, oh, like, you know, power and money isn't everything because they, you know, they have money and then they end up still killing themselves, you know. What do you think they're, they're that's driving them? What do you think caused that? If you're not aware that, like, maybe somebody in your family committed suicide and, 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 and and was, you know, was exposed to traumatic situations that caused them to want to commit suicide. You know, that feeling, if you don't deal with it, make yourself aware of it, consciousness, shine the line of consciousness, shine the light of consciousness, shine the light of consciousness to heal this thing. If something is covered, a wound will fester, shine the light of consciousness and heal this thing. It will keep happening over and over and over again. It doesn't matter. Money doesn't mean anything if you're carrying the burden of your ancestors into one generation after another generation after another generation. That's not even talk about what your consciousness is carrying. Okay, so that feeling of this existential sense of dread, like your you know life is about to end. Well, like I said, I had a grandmother who her last memory was, oh my God, like this, I'm about to die. You have a grandfather whose last memory is, oh my God, I'm about to die. All of that... I'm about to die feeling is stored in your DNA as trauma because that's fucking traumatic. (laughs) Hello. So even if you haven't experienced a near death experience or a life, a life threatening situation, you're still carrying the PTSD genetically of people in your family who have. So now you're fearful and you're anxious. Why do you, then why then? Bro, then of course that voice in your head is always constantly going to be anxious. Like, holy shit, like what's about to happen? That voice, the voice of the ego, the one that, you know, we we fight with, that we tell, shut the fuck up, right? Because it's like, oh my God, it's so scared. It's so terrified. That is the collective voice of your ancestors and their pain. It needs to be soothed. It needs to be soothed. I have found peace. You guys have been through with me on my journey, um, even up to this point. The greatest peace I've found has not been grappling with the voice. I've tried everything. I've tried meditating. I, I, I've tried mushrooms. I, I've tried everything. Um, and I've cataloged it here. The greatest peace that I've found is to soothe it. See, it's traumatized. It is the voice of your parents. It is the voice of society. Guess what society is made of? Society 
is a conglomeration of suffering, people in pain, and all of that trauma that we're all carrying, all 7 billion souls now carrying that shit. That is that voice in your head, the Siri. And, and it's just trying to avoid suffering because it has suffered. That is the voice of PTSD that we all carry in, in each and every one of us in our minds. What is it calling out for? To be seen, to be soothed. So when my voice, when the voice in my head starts to panic over something, right? It's like I call my husband and he's not answering. And the voice of my grandfather who lost a spouse, right? And I didn't realize, comes through in the voice in my head and it's like something terrible happened. And now it's afraid and it's scared because it's going through that fear and anger and depression and anxiety that my grandfather went through when he found out that his wife had died. Now I'm looping that. I'm looping that. I can now pause and go, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Hey, that's not what's happening. It's okay. You get it? It's You start having compassion, not just for others, because that's important, because they're in it with you. We're all in this shit together. But you also start also having compassion for yourself, for your ancestors, for their trauma. start healing them so the book is called or I should say while the book is called it didn't start with you and it deals with trauma my response is this will start with you and it will be healing anything that you can do to heal your psyche your body to make yourself aware that everything you feel isn't necessarily from you. You see, all of the patients that are mentioned in these books, once they became aware that, wait, this is not mine, they let it go. Because they did not identify with it, they were able to separate from it and let it go. It's not yours. And that's what the book teaches. It says you identify what these fears are. Understand that, look, it's an echo of your grandparents and your grand uncles and your uncles, your father and your mother's pain. And you go, this is not mine. A lot of what is you is yours isn't even yours, honestly, because a lot of the stuff that you went through stems from other people sort of <sighs> blindly getting through life too. You know, there's a temptation to just sit under a tree. I get it now. I get why Buddha was just like, bruh, <laughs> shit. You know, or he says attachment is a is you know, soft suffering, and 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 you you can take that and kind of look at it in a different way. Yeah, you're. It's trauma, right? You're these things are attached to you, but they're not yours. It's not you. Love is a way back home, right? This world is what it is. You know, I don't know if this is the world I would have created, but who knows? Outside of this body, maybe. Maybe I exactly would have done this. And clearly, since I am a, you know, a part of the collective, this is the world that we have. This is what we designed, and we designed it for a reason. So, okay. It is as it should be.
but when you interact with people, if you have to come back to this episode and listen to it, understand this. There are people who are going through stuff that's not even their stuff. (laughs) And they're just walking, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm worried. It's not your stuff. If you're afraid of something that has never happened to you, happening to you, you got to pause and ask yourself, where did that fear come from? Because it's not yours. Or at least not in this present incarnation, or it belongs to somebody else. It's too, there's, there's a lot happening here. You have to account for both. Your consciousness having a physical experience, you have to account for your experiences as a conscious being, your past experiences and all the shit that you're bringing through. And understand that you also have to account for your information that has been stored in your DNA. The DNA serves its purpose. It's supposed to store information. Look, the reason why you are strong, beautiful, resilient also comes from them, right? All the things that intuitively you know also comes from them. Your skills, your creativity. Yeah, it, it, it's a double-edged sword. So you take the good and soothe the bad. Okay. Whew, guys, to wrap it up, you should not have hatred in your heart towards anyone. But if you do, please understand that the most efficient way to reincarnate as any group is to hate them or harm them. It doesn't end with you. Right? So whatever sort of energy you are generating will get carried on to the next incarnation. If you are fed up with Earth, which some people listening to them to this probably are, um, and you want to move on to the next place, then one, uh, you listen this far, so I'll tell you the answer. Let go. Look, if you're listening to this, my guess is what you're probably, tw- let's say you're 15 years old even, probably not, but let's say 20, okay, you're in your 20s. At most average, you've got 80 years left. In the grand scheme of eternity, it's a drop in the bucket. Be compassionate, be empathetic, and, and understand that everybody's working through some shit that they're not even aware that they're working through. If you can live the next 50, 40, 30 years with that understanding in the back of your mind, that is the way you get out of here. That's it. You treat everyone as though it's someone that you have loved and lost because more than likely they are someone you've loved and lost. If you if you believe in incarn- reincarnation and you believe in consciousness, then clearly you've lived. This is not your first go. It's not your second go. It's not your hundredth go. You've been doing this over and over again more than likely for who knows how long. So every person that you come in path with, you need to understand that on some level they're in your life because you've interacted with them for whatever reason. And either they were loved ones that you loved and lost, or they were people that you har- that you harmed and you hurt, and now it's your chance to make amends. But either way, either approach will make it so that you don't have to keep coming back here. So you can graduate to the next level, the next phase. All right, I think I've said enough, guys.